the Normans built the first proper castles after the invasion of 1066. They needed bases from where they could patrol the countryside and strongholds to protect themselves from Saxon attack. These strongholds were also their homes. The castles had to be built in a hurry, so they were made of timber and placed on top of an earth mound called a mot, with a courtyard below known as a bailey. Two years after the Battle of Hastings, William the Conqueror built a mot and bailey castle here at Warwick. That's all that remains of that early castle, the mot. The Bayeux Tapestry shows us the big disadvantage of those early castles. Attackers could easily set fire to the wooden palisades and buildings. So the castle builders began to use stone instead. The first thing was to build a stone wall around the bailey in place of the wooden palisades. And then to build another stone wall on top of the mot. This was called a shell keep. But the earth on top of the mot often couldn't take the weight of a strong tower. So they built a keep in the bailey instead. And for added safety, the entrance to this was at first floor level up a flight of steps. It wasn't very comfortable living in the keep. So eventually the lords moved out into proper houses in the bailey. This meant that they weren't so well protected. So the walls had to be strengthened even more. Of course, the weakest part of any castle was the entrance. You needed a really strong gatehouse and even an outer gate or barbican. Edward I added an extra ring of walls around his castles, always lower in height than the inner walls. Round the whole thing, there was often a moat. Of course, many castles couldn't have a water-filled moat because they were too high up like at Warwick, where the River Avon was too far below the castle to fill the moat. So another solution had to be found. This dry moat, or rather this ditch, isn't nearly as deep as it used to be. But then it must have been a major obstacle for any would-be attacker. And rightly so. What you can see on the hill will help you to visualise the castle put there around 1080 at Tomen Amir, near Trasvanith. Earl Hugh of Chester caused it to be placed on top of this great mot which he had thrown up inside the remains of a much older Roman fort, whose walls were substantial enough to make quite a useful outer bailey. Look how that high mound still manages to dominate the country all around, even after nine centuries of erosion. It would have been perhaps five foot taller and steeper and on top of course there would have been a wooden tower. When you are building a defence, earth and timber have tremendous advantages. They are relatively strong but more important still they are quick and cheap to erect for materials readily at hand. A good body of men could build one of these, could knock them up in oh something like a couple of months or so. Never wondered why Wales is called the land of castles. <laughs> Just have a look at this lot. Each dot represents a site identified on the ground, and these are only the early earthwork castles. It was a frenzy of building that stretched over no more than 150 years. There's something to be seen by the ordinary visitor at most of them. Though one of the best at Tomina Rodwith which is just north of the Horseshoe Pass beyond Llangothlin, is not in fact Norman. The idea of Mott and Bailey had been picked up by the Welsh and adapted to their needs. Owen Gwyneth ordered this earthwork to be thrown up in 1149, but the buildings that were here, one of Owen's compatriots destroyed a mere eight years later in 1157. Because the castle at Tomina Rodwith suffered from the major weakness of earth and timber castles, it fell to attack by fire, as so many of them did. The Bayeux Tapestry shows what happened to one such at Dinan in Brittany. 
on the left, a surprise attack by cavalry charge. When that fails, two knights set fire to the timber with long torches. When the defenders finally surrender, we see them holding out the keys on the tip of a lance. It was more costly in time and money, but the obvious answer was stone instead of wood. Several existing castles were refortified in this way. The old wooden palisade defences replaced in stone to form a shell keep. Here in Cardiff, another castle that owes its sighting to an earlier Roman fort, stone replaced wood around the top of the mot. Accommodation inside was still mostly wood, but at least now the first steps had been taken to defeat attack by fire. Of course, it would have been better still if the towers themselves were built in stone. And indeed, in places of great strategic importance, like the wide crossing at Chepstow, castles were built in stone right at the start. This was up within a few years of the conquest. It's just a stout stone hall. That's its entrance, and there should be a flight of stairs up to it. The only other openings in the walls are windows which are all safely on the edge of the cliff. If I was being attacked here, I'd just sit tight inside and hope my opponent would give up and go away. A keep right in the heartland of Gwynedd. Dolwyth Ellen, built by Llewellyn the Great, Welsh, but look at its Norman style. If I wanted to get in there, a battering ram wouldn't be any good because the walls are too thick, the door is too high off the ground for me to get a good run at it, and of course it's too high for me to scale with a ladder. The only way I could get in there would be by treachery or a siege to starvation. But if this keep were built on anything other than stone, if it were not straight on the rock, then I'd go for the corners. I'd get the sappers to dig a tunnel underneath with props to hold up the roof. And when I was ready, set fire to the props, and down she comes. Since the corner of the keep was the weak point, you just had to strengthen it, like this. But of course it was better still if you could get rid of the corners altogether. And the only way to do that was to build a wall round. Round keeps like this at Skenfrith are common all over the southern marches, dating mostly from soon after 1200. and all of them, right up to the greatest, Pembroke, retain the first floor entrance, which is such an absolutely essential element to the final refuge, the keep. The part played by the defenders could only be expanded if a way was discovered to develop the outer bailey, because it was there where the curtain wall was so very vulnerable, vulnerable to attack, by battering ram, by siege engines, by scaling ladders, and even by undermining. So it was essential to keep the attacker away from the walls. The ditch outside would hinder them. But if I could fill it with water, like this one at White Castle, then we might be able to stop them altogether. But a determined attacker could fill in the ditch and in would go the assault tower to storm the wall top. Another way has got to be found, because once an attacker actually reaches the walls, it's practically impossible to dislodge him without leaning so far out over the parapet as to be exposed to his fire. You could build out a temporary wooden structure from the top here, uh, store it uh, during times of peace, and under attack, the crossbowmen could climb onto these hordes 
these fighting platforms so as to get a safe covering view of the wall at the bottom. You could use these on a keep or a curtain wall to rain projectiles down beneath. It was a temporary measure, only in use for some two centuries, because already the defenders were thinking up a new answer to defeat the old enemy, fire. Now let's take a look at this tower. It's even more elaborate. It's got an extra bit on the top, which was the guard room. It's a bit dangerous up here, because of these gaps in the floor. They're called machicolations, and you use them for dropping stones or for pouring nasty liquids like boiling pitch or quicklime onto the attackers beneath. Conwy Castle, situated across the river from Deganwy, is one of the most famous castles in Wales. It was built by Edward between 1283 and 1287. It must have been the most terrifying thing ever seen by the Welsh. Conway Castle was a masterpiece of design. How many men do you think were needed to defend such a vast place? 3,000? 300? Only 30. Of those 30, half were watchmen and assistants, and only 15 were bowmen. Those 15 bowmen controlled the area from the towers. Nothing escaped their deadly arrows. Carnarvon is not concentric. It's got only a single line of curtain walling, but inside that are two levels of wall passage running all around the castle, and these give access to arrow slits sighted at all the vital points. This castle cast double that of Conway, and even 50 years of building left the domestic quarters unfinished. But the defences had received special attention. And here's something which is nearer to a medieval machine gun than I can possibly imagine. It's very ingenious indeed. There's an arrow slit on the outside wall there, another one there, which can be fired through, both of them, by one archer in that direction and in that direction. But more ingenious still is this. The next hole there can be served by three skillful archers, all firing at the same time through one hole on the outside. One of them fires through there, another centrally there, and the third through there. Ingenious, isn't it? Just a simple archway in the curtain wall. Here again, the answer was logical. If wall towers could make an effective defence for the curtain, why not put one on either side of the gate? Then, by linking them together with a room over the gate passage, you could control the entry properly. So, in the 1220s, the twin tired gatehouse was born, or rather, reborn, because once again the Romans had thought of it a thousand years earlier. 
Here's a modern rebuilding of a Roman gateway at the back of Cardiff Castle. Not entirely accurate, perhaps, but close enough to the original to catch the idea. And once more, Chepstow was in the forefront of this new development. William Marshall's sons extended the old castle after 1225 by enclosing an extra bailey. And to protect the entry, they built a powerful twin-tired gatehouse. Harlech here and the rest embodied the very latest thinking in defence, not only in Britain, but in Europe too. Using the imagination of a highly gifted artist, Alan Sorrell, we can take that leap back in time to visualise the imposing power of Harlech Castle. Even after emasculation by time and weather and scarring by many battles past, the gatehouse at Harlech still throws down its haughty challenge for all comers. To the 13th century visitor, it must have presented a daunting prospect indeed. And across this ditch, between two stone towers, a stone bridge, with a drawbridge at either end. This is where the pivots of the inner one would have been. So as the drawbridge rose up, its rear end came down into this pit underneath me here. This brings us up to the gatehouse. And now for the gate passage. And here there would have been a pair of massive wooden doors closing in, secured by a drawbar, heavy drawbar across there. And now a portcullis, worked by a man in the room above. And as I advance towards the next obstacle, I'm very fully aware of the crossbowmen behind those arrow slits. And just look up there. You've got to use your imagination, but just suppose the arch complete, across the arch planks, in the planks trap doors. They're murder holes. And they had a double purpose. First, to shower projectiles, missiles, boiling water, whatever you like, onto unwelcome visitors. And second, to pour water, this time cold water, onto fires that might be started against the gates. And now for a second portcullis and a second group of doors with a drawbar. And another portcullis and another door and another drawbar. All cunningly arranged so that anyone coming in could be isolated while his credentials were checked by closing the barrier behind before opening the one in front. Yet manning a castle like this, probably no more than 30 men at arms. Careful planning and strong walls did the rest. The whole principle here is that by building the inner ward much higher, you command the entire outer ward from its walls. Brilliant, but once again, not a new idea. Romans had used it to great effect on their city walls at Constantinople, and it had been known to the Egyptians over 4,000 years ago. Carfili is literally a floating island fortress surrounded by the waters of its man-made lakes. On the east side, a massive fortified dam wall. Here, you would have to pass through no less than three major gateways before you reach the inner ward and the heart of the castle. Gilbert de Clare incorporated every last element of up-to-date 1268 defensive technology in a truly frightening display of military bravado. Built by the most powerful of the Marcha lords, the purpose was to check the continuing expansion of Llewellyn ap Griffith, Prince of North Wales. His influence was becoming an increasing factor to reckon with.
the concentric castle was now an active, aggressive fighting machine. Firepower had been increased dramatically because the defenders, high on the inner walls, could fire over the head of their fellows on the outer defences. Quite simply, a double ring of defence made far more effective use of the space available. This is the most regular concentric castle in Britain, built on flat, marshy ground without any high land to help defend it. The very name Beau Morris means fair marsh. Beside the outer gate here, there's a small fortified dock for ships to bring in supplies. They would come straight in there and incidentally, there's one of the original iron rings for the ships to tie up at. They'd sail in through this sort of sea passage, right direct from the sea. If we go through the outer gate here, past the guarding arrow loops and the threatening murder holes, You have to take a sharp turn to the right to get through to the next gate, past this barbican here. And in the meantime, there are crossbowmen up there, and there, and there. <laughs> Here's what a concentric castle is all about. Just look how the inner defences tower over the outer wall. The outer wall's pretty substantial too. Look at all those arrow loops. You wouldn't stand much of a chance against those chaps up there, would you? Imagine you were leading a Welsh army trying to capture Catfilly Castle. Let's say you've marched here without losing too many men on the way. You're camped all around the castle, and you're trying to work out the best way to attack the enemy inside. The only way in is across that deep moat to the drawbridge and its defending gatehouse. But the drawbridge is up. And this wooden grill, the portcullis, is down. The gatehouse is bristling with soldiers. Wherever you look, there's either open water where your men are exposed to arrows, or there's stone, strong walls and stronger towers, all bursting with the enemy who are well protected on the battlements and behind the arrow slits. What can you do? You decide to risk the lives of your men, and you give the order, attack. You've already lost a lot of men on the first assault. Some of you get through the gatehouse to the outer ward. Oh no, what are we here? Another gatehouse, and you're pretty well trapped. From the high inner towers and walls, the missiles are raining fast and furious. This is turning out to be a massacre. Well, there's nothing to do but continue. Attack this gatehouse as well. Above you in the archway are rows of murder holes. Through these, the enemy is hurling rocks, spears, arrows, and anything else he can find to try and stop your advance. But, after fierce fighting and a lot of luck, at last you're through. Not many left by now of your original army. You burst into this, the inner ward, the heart of the castle, and you fight hand to hand with the best of the enemy's troops. Imagine it. The shouts, the screams, the clash of sword on sword, the blood running everywhere, bodies falling dead all around you. Only after all this can you truly say you have captured the castle. Now all you have to do is 
defend it against others. Strong castles had high walls. You'd need a very long ladder to climb this wall and it wouldn't do you much good either because along the top of the wall ran the wall walk. This enabled defenders, and often there weren't very many of them, to quickly dash to any trouble spot. Wooden shutters across these gaps, known as embrasures, protected you from enemy fire. If you think the walls are daunting, look at this tower. If the enemy captured your curtain wall, you could still shoot them from up here or from any of the other towers around. From this loophole, you could shoot sideways and downwards and so protect the foot of the castle wall. Ah! This was the constable's toilet. It's called the Garda Robe because people used to hang their robes and clothes up in here, the idea being that the smell will keep the moths away. That's how we get our modern word, wardrobe. Below this seat, if you uh, sent anything down there, it ended up in the castle ditch. And sometimes an enemy would get one of their poor men to uh, wriggle up the toilet shaft, oh, enter the castle that way, then he'd go downstairs, open the gates, because nobody would touch him, and letting his friends. Some very famous castles were captured by somebody climbing up the toilet. The 11th Earl of Warwick, Thomas Beecham, was a famous knight. He commanded part of the army at the battles of Cressy in 1346 and Poitiers, ten years later. Two of the greatest English victories in the Hundred Years' War. Just look at Thomas Beecham's handiwork. Imagine trying to capture that lot. Thomas had obviously picked up a lot of ideas about castle defence when he was fighting in France. At Warwick, Richard III started to build a keep with gun ports to fire cannon in defence. Richard died in 1485, soon after building was begun, and no one ever bothered to finish this keep. Why? Well, because castle defence just didn't matter anymore. In fact, that was true a hundred years earlier in Earl Thomas's time. England was a much more peaceful place by then, and Earl Thomas just didn't expect to be attacked. Look how thin that wall is. Scarcely any defence against a battering ram. Earl Thomas had seen many impressive castles when he was campaigning in France and he just wanted to copy them. So he built himself a superb place to live. Luxurious, comfortable, and much more of a home than a fortress. The front of the castle is in fact just a spectacular front door. And in the 14th century, it would have been even more exciting to look at. The castle would have had tall turrets and wooden gables painted in bright colors. The high roofs would have had gilded weather vanes and great coats of arms. Even the walls on the outside may have been painted. Gradually, as castles began to lose their military importance, people didn't want to live in them anymore. They just weren't comfortable enough. But some people continued to build spectacular homes like this, not for defensive reasons, just to show off. 